Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. How are we doing, folks? I hope things are going well with you. We got a lot of sunshine. In fact, for the next week or so, and for those folks who, who are not here live with us, I mean, gee whiz, this is, this is very enjoyable to know that we're going to be relaxing this time around. But as you know, we just got off the, the primary campaign trail. I was part of that whole process. I met a lot of folks, and uh, we talked about issues and whatever. And uh, in all due respect, I felt really good about it, um, the response we got. We got a 13% or better in that respect. Uh, and, uh, and we were able to put some of the issues out. Unfortunately, the media didn't do their job. You know, they didn't, they didn't recognize the fact that I did have this cap on, this Vietnam <laughs> cap on, that I was a veteran and I did have a, a T-shirt with my business on. I'm a businessman mm -hmm. aspect of it. I took my hat off at one point in time and said, I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the bottom line, they just didn't recognize that. Uh, there was another plan on the table. We can talk about that at no, another point in time. But I want to thank all of you who supported um, supported the the campaign and uh, and also to all of the other candidates that ran for office. I thought they each had issues that they were able to throw on the table. Again, fortunately, they also too weren't able to get their issues on the table. So we didn't really have a discussion. We in fact we talked more among ourselves about the issues. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, the folks were able to relate to that aspect mm -hmm. of it. The incumbent incumbent Loretta Smith. Um, uh, she ended up with uh, 70, 70 percent or so of the vote, and uh, she got majority. So therefore, there's not going to be a, a general election, the, 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 the mm -hmm. general aspect of it. However, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the issues are still out there, and we're going to discuss those issues because those are very important. And I think Loretta understands that. But we we want to we want to commend her and 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 uh, and congratulate her for for IE. Now she's going to have four more years, and and hopefully she will. Uh, understand some of the issues that I brought onto the table and some of the and the other candidates that were there too. So again, uh, congratulations, Loretta, and we will we'll be working with you. And hopefully, you will come over here on the show and and we'll just kind of track uh, those next four years in terms of uh, what you're going to be doing and the benefit it's going to have to the people in District Two, as far as Multnomah County is concerned. So having said that, now let's get on with the show. Now I've got with me here uh, the chair of the Republican Party. I've got Art, Art uh, Robinson with me to, here. He's been on the show before. I was going to also have the chairman of the Democratic Party. Unfortunately, I can't find the guy. I don't <laughs> well, know where the guy is. He's pretty scarce when I'm around. Yeah, well, is that right? <laughs> well, Bob is out there tracking him. I mean, he's, he's out there <laughs> looking for him. He's checking him out. And he said to me, Bruce, he's, he's on the trail, and, and hopefully we're going to get him to come out here, get the chair of the Democratic Party to be also part of the process. I think it's very, very important because this is a very important race at this point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, citizens are wanting to know what's going on and what each of the entities, the, the major parties, are, are basically. What's their platform and what's their plan for Oregon? Mm -hmm. we've, got some, we've got some major issues that, are, that we are faced with at this point in time, and I think it's very, very important that we at least discuss because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's the vote. Mm -hmm. You're gonna get you're gonna get your mail. You're gonna get your mail out, and you're gonna select someone. You're gonna select the issues. The issues that are gonna affect your pocketbook, your kids' education, your surroundings, and on and on and on. Okay, with that, so that's where we are. So, Art, welcome, welcome. Thank you. You know, and what we want to do this time around, I, I'd like to spend a little bit more time. If you can just sort of reflect, if you will, uh, what do you think about the primary, and uh, what do you think? Well, I'm I'm happy with the primary. We we have a lot of great candidates that were selected. We have some great candidates that weren't selected, okay. and uh, I think the Republicans will do very well in these elections. It's our job to, I, I believe, and I think there's ample evidence that two thirds of the people of Morgan or more share Republican values more than they share Democrat values. But we have to have the skills and energy to go out there and help them to understand that. So it's our job to make the people realize mm -hmm. that we care about them, that we want to help them, and that the things we stand for will help them. Mm -hmm. That's our job. And even though our values are much closer to Oregonian values, if we don't, if we don't articulate that, the people won't know. Right. How so would now you we have five values? months to do that. Yeah. How would you define those values? And, you know, as, as, you, as you're saying. Well, our right, values you know, are, are um, things like closer. Let's say, nothing's perfect, right? right, right we have right, a platform. Right, they right. have a platform. But we, our values are far closer to those that are built into every human being. 
the values of liberty, freedom, uh, independence, uh, private property, all these things, uh, we can talk about them individually. Mm -hmm. But the value, fundamental values of, are, 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 are timeless. They're thousands of years old. Uh, they were first in our literature. We know in ancient times these things took place. In the Bible, they were articulated very, very well, of course, by our Creator. And then the founders of our country in our Constitution and Bill of Rights articulated them for our country, and now they flow down to us. But the Republican Party stands largely for timeless values that are built into every human being. In other words, if you have a person, he thinks, but he also feels. He feels viscerally. And if you're talking to an American and you're talking Republican principles, he will intuitively respond more positively than he will to the principles that Democrats advocate, if you're communicating correctly. So our principles are more the timeless principles that are built into human beings. And we know from our Bibles, from our Constitution, from the great people that we've had to give us the freedom we have, we know that those are the best ways for people to live together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. People don't live together well when they have a big government telling them everything to do with making slaves of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we oppose slavery. We not got slavery out mm -hmm, of our country. Mm -hmm. And yet now we've got a system where half the kids that graduate from college are already enslaved to debt. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's not good. Now that doesn't, they're caught, you know, the schools have gotten too expensive, largely they've gotten too expensive because of government meddling. Mm -hmm. So I sympathize when I went to college, you could work your way through college. Today you can't. Somebody comes along and says, I'll loan you some money. Well, obviously take it if you want to get that education. But it doesn't have to be that way. And it's government meddling in our educational system that has driven the costs up. Mm -hmm. And this we see throughout our society, where people become enslaved. They become enslaved to debt, they become enslaved in all sorts of ways because of government overreach. Mm -hmm. People in Washington, even to some extent people in Salem, trying to tell them how to live their lives and taking the resources of the American people and distributing in such a way that they can control how people mm -hmm. live their lives. We want people to be free. Okay, you know you, you mentioned you mentioned slavery and a couple of yeah. couple instances of that, and when you think about the history of the Republican Party, mm -hmm. the abolishment of slavery was always identified sure. with them. That's Why right. is it that the Republican Party has not talked a little bit more about that? Well, I, I don't know. People tend to forget history, mm -hmm. but of course, you know that was 150 years ago, yeah. and uh, it's to be it's still disingenuous to say because I belong to a party that 150 years ago was instrumental in abolishing slavery is not it's not quite right for me to say well I say you should vote for me because 150 years ago my party was on the right side of that issue we were also on the right side of it during the civil rights movement yeah the Democrats were opposed to the civil rights movement in general and the Republicans were for it uh, this happened because as I said, our values are timeless. They're the ones that are built into human beings. We, you and I oppose slavery, not for some intellectual reason. We intuitively understand that we want to be free and we don't want another man not to be free. Since we understand that, and it's intuitive, it's built into human beings to want to be free. So, uh, obviously the Republican Party has, at the time of Lincoln, at the time yeah, of exactly. Martin Luther King, right. found itself on the right side of that issue. Mm -hmm. Today, we don't have the slavery issue, although we're beginning to have it because our people are becoming more and more enslaved to government. Powerful people with a lot of tax money are beginning to tell us more and more what to do. In fact, we've got to the point where they feel that they can record all our phone calls and record all our internet connections and keep track of us like we were a bunch of little, you know, animals. So uh, there is a, uh, there is a, part of the human race, a, a subset that wants control, that wants power, that wants to enslave the people around them. That's what happened during the Civil War. That's what happened during the Civil Rights Movement. We beat them twice, and now they're here with high technology to enslave us again. And you will find the Republican Party more on the correct side of that issue because we are fundamentally on the side of the values that are built into human beings. Mm -hmm. Now that's not to say everything we do is right. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I, can, I can certainly say with certainty 
that we are far more on the side of the values that are built into people that give them the best opportunity to enjoy the wonderful life they've been blessed with mm -hmm. than are our opponents. Mm -hmm. But there's battles all the time uh, within each group to try to figure out what values they should have. You know, you know the, another area, uh, I'll use the word inclusiveness, and mm -hmm. you know, we sort of talked about that when I first met yeah. you, and I was very impressed when, when you used the word engagement as opposed yeah. to a woman minority, i.e. a person <laughs> aspect of it. Uh, talk a little bit about that because I think that's a well, very important piece. One of the ways that you enslave people is to create divisions between them. You divide, divide and conquer, they say. So uh, it, we, we, we're all Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, our values are pretty similar across the nation. Uh, I can come up here and talk to you and your friends, or I can walk down the street in North Dakota and talk to the first guy I meet. We'll find that we have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. So American values are pretty consistent throughout our country. But those who wish to control us divide us, and they find any division they can. They got skin color. They, got, they even try to divide us by sex almost. Uh, these divisions where you represent that there's the Hispanic community and the African American community and the white community and the Asian community, these divisions that they emphasize help to enslave us because they teach us that we're different from one another and we're not. So to, when you come, say, to Multnomah County and you're talking to men and women of the African American community, He's talking to Americans. The, 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 we're all the same. We have, about the, we have the same intellectual capabilities. We have the same physical capabilities. We're all people. And I, I think, and you agree, you and I decided we were going to use the words that divide us. Uh, we want to engage all Americans. There are Americans here. There are Americans down south. There are Americans everywhere. We all speak the same language. And when we speak a language, that emphasizes these artificial divisions, we're helping our enemies because the divisions are one of the things they use to control us. Mm -hmm. You know, another area that I know that, that people tend to resonate here within this, within the metro mm -hmm. area aspect of it, is the issue of education. Mm -hmm. uh, parents are very concerned about the, yes. the lack of education I'll within bet. our public schools. Yes. And, uh, and the and non uniformity of education. Yes, yes, yes. Across this country, and I've been an educator all my life. Mm -hmm. I taught at the university, I taught chemistry to 300 students every year, and then my family got in the education business, and we've supplied curriculums to about 100,000 American children. Uh, and one of the things that, that uh, worries me greatly is the tremendous difference between the educational opportunities of one area and another area. Uh, in Washington, D.C., the Wall Street Journal reported that 40 percent of the students in Washington, D.C. don't graduate from high school, and the 60 percent who do, on average, read at a fifth grade level. Mm -hmm. The schools are awful. Now, it happens that that community is mostly African American. Yet I know there are plenty of definitive studies that show there isn't any difference at all between the abilities in education of a white man and a black man. There's mm -hmm. no difference. Mm -hmm. But here they are. In that society, in that area, and interestingly, it's controlled by the United States Congress because they run D.C. Here we have this terrible uh, lack of opportunity for the students in Washington, D.C. And it shouldn't be that way. Uh, some people say it's economic, but it doesn't have to be. The institutions that collect money for education should spread evenly throughout the country. So we have tremendous disparities uh, between these subdivisions they've created. And it's it's very harmful because every young American should have the same educational opportunities. One of the reasons that it's this way is a lack of local control. We used to have the best schools in the world. I, I went to school, you know, in the 50s, and, and, and I got a wonderful education in the public schools. That got me into Caltech. They taught me science, and I've had a wonderful life in science. I owe it to the public schools. Schools aren't there anymore. At that time, American students scored higher than anyone else in the world academically. Now we are almost at the bottom. And that parallels taking control away from the localities and giving it to the government. The government is dominating. So if the localities, if D.C.'s parents control those schools, they wouldn't permit them to have these problems. Mm -hmm. But they're controlled by the federal government. And these people, uh, you know, they don't know how to run schools. 
So we need to get our schools back to local control. If we get back to local control, the parents and the people in the community will make darn sure their students learn. And when America had local control, we have on the frontier, everything was locally controlled, yeah, yeah, yeah. and everybody was literate. We've got 99% literacy on the frontier, and these guys were learning how to read around campfires. Yeah. With locally, local control, our schools would be fine. With federal control, and to some extent state control, they've deteriorated very badly, and we have another step now. We have Common Core. It's just another way of the federal government forcing everyone into the same mold and when you try to do that with students, it doesn't work. Mm. We don't, when, when you make the point about the federal government aspect, you know, that, like, it's like these in, this entity, if you will, that controls mm. all of us aspect of it. You know, this country supposedly was under the minds of, of the, it was a government of the people, mm -hmm. by the people, and for the people. That's right. And they represented our ideas. Mm -hmm. What happened to that? Right. Well, what happened is, it's simple. Uh, there are, we, we know it's from history, thousands mm -hmm. of years of history. Mm -hmm. But within every society, there is a group of people that thrive on power. They thrive on control. And those people gravitate toward government, and they try to make the government control us. This has happened constantly in history. The only reason you and I are free is because the very, very smart men we were very lucky to have, the Founding Fathers, and they created a Constitution and Bill of Rights that would protect our freedom and keep the government controlling us. Most people don't realize the Constitution is just a list of things the government can't do. <laughs> they can't hurt you. They can't control you. And because that was done, you and I still live in the greatest country on earth. Uh, but there always is within the society, I don't care whether you're talking about a little organization or a church or a community or a, a nation, there are always some people who thrive on power and control of others. And we need government procedures to protect us from them. The Founding Fathers gave us a government that protected us from them. But they're always trying, always trying, always trying to get more of our money, trying to get more regulations and taxes. And everything they do is to try to control us more. And that, of course, now is one of the big differences between the Democrat Party and the Republican Party. The Democrat Party is all about control of the people. The Republican Party it's about leaving the people in control of their own lives. That's a big difference between the parties now. Well, you know, on that same uh, that same level, one of the things, one of the major ingredients that that many many African Americans have, and also the Hispanics and the like mm -hmm. have, is, a, is the lack, if you will, of inclusion of their varying cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, in the ed educational system, when you start thinking about here in the in the in the state of Oregon, mm -hmm. uh, they had recently, well, not recently, but they had passed, if you will, policy in the legislature that said that they were going to actually get those, uh, get the, the, they were going to educate, it was going to be in the system, if you will, in terms mm -hmm. of educating people about their, their, their respective cultures. Well, that, that didn't happen. Yeah, but, but see, that, that's, what been, that's been our, in our schools the whole time. Our country is made of immigrants, right? Totally. And as they melded together under American principles to create our nation, they brought their cultures with them. My family, uh, I... The, the culture that came and we came from France and England, the ones that, you know, my principal forebears, we still have much of the culture that came from those countries. There's no reason why you have to leave your culture behind when you meld together in a free nation. And, uh, and, and, and so we can keep our cultures and we take the best parts of those, especially, and memorialize them. I tell stories about my ancestors that I'm proud of. Mm -hmm. And it, it reflects the values that they brought from where they came mm -hmm. from. So there's no reason to leave behind your culture. But we also have to consider the things we share. A love of freedom, mm -hmm. a love of freedom of mm -hmm. personal responsibility. Uh, of course, our families are very important to us. All the things that we value in life. And uh, because we meld together as a nation, doesn't need we have to leave any of our cultural aspects behind. The problem comes when opportunists start teaching segments of our society that they should be a part, live apart. They shouldn't be a part of the American dream because they should be a little island and not joining the American way of life in order to preserve uh, their culture. And that isn't necessary. Okay. Uh, I, I know men, and I've worked in my life with people from very many different cultures, and uh, it's more enjoyable. You have a richer life. Yeah, yeah. Well, I said, like I said, the point here in, in this particular area is that yeah. many 
feel that they're not teaching the cultures in the education system. Well, of course, but that, that's because there's no local control. Uh, the state and the federal government are deciding what will be taught. If your local people, the parents of the children in any part of this county, were controlling what goes on in the school, they would make sure that it had the cultural component that they wanted. So you're saying their kids, the, they're their kids. Elected the officials are pretty well controlling, not not responding. Yeah, and well. they're doing it top down from the federal government. Some guy in the federal government is going to decide how your culture will be preserved <laughs> in your community. Can't mm -hmm. be done. Mm -hmm. Not even from the state. It's local control. Ed parents are responsible for the education of their children. But it has been found, experimentally in the United States and elsewhere, that it is good to have community schools because the resources required and so forth. And no one is left out, you know, who doesn't have. But the, the, um, it's the local people that should control the schools. Who should control in Multnomah County, and not even countywide, the districts, the school districts here, should be controlled in terms of what is taught to the students, what books they use, what culture is represented, mm -hmm. should be decided by the parents of those children. That's what local control means. So the tax money that's appropriated for those students should go right into the school board <laughs> in that little community. The school board, you know, reflecting the values of the community and the parents who are involved, sees to it that those students are taught what they wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. And they're, of course, going to teach them to learn their history, their personal history, and their cultural history. Uh, we, local control solves all this. Local control. Local control. Folks, we're interviewing Art Robinson, who's chair of, the, of Oregon's Republican Party, and uh, we're sort of getting a feel, if you will, of the folks who are going to be running in the general election, and, and hopefully that value system is comparable to what he's sharing with us today. And well, so this is excitement here. This I'm weekend. sure that the value system of at least two-thirds of the uh, people of Oregon is much closer to the Republican values than the Democrat values. I'm certain of that. We just had a, in last November, we had a measure on the ballot in Josephine County, and it was a government overreach issue. It was a straight Republican issue. They wanted to extend the control of the county government mm -hmm. over the people more strongly. Mm -hmm. And when the dust settled, the people voted against that measure 79 to 21. Mm -hmm. We have 42% Republican registration. We got all the Republicans, the independents, and we even got half the Democrats. Gee. And it was simply a simple Republican issue. It was, shall we make the government stronger and make it control the people in the county more, more rigorously? Yeah. The people didn't want it. Wow. Look, let, let, in fact, on that particular point, let's share with the, with the viewing audience in terms, because you're running for office, right? I'm running for Congress. You're running for Congress before. against? Peter DeFazio. Peter DeFazio. For the right third there. time. For the third time. <laughs> Okay, let's talk a little bit about that in terms of uh, what, what do you think? What are your chances? Let's talk about that. I think we have a good chance. Okay. I wouldn't uh, ask people to support a campaign okay. and work on it if I didn't think we had a good chance. But this man's been entrenched. He's been there 25 years. He has very this deep. This is your third time, right? Yeah. Okay. He has very deep roots in the community. He's not been good for the community. Our lumber industry has been destroyed on his watch. And he's done a lot of different things that were not good for our District 4. And he has voted a straight liberal socialist line in Congress, which isn't good for the American people. Mm -hmm. So it's not good to have him in office. But once they've been in office 25 years, they've got a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have uh, a far better chance to beat him than he thinks. Mm -hmm. But that's not for certain. Uh, my view is, well, he's still there and he needs to go. So we'll work on it. Mm -hmm. Well, and from an Oregonian standpoint, yeah. aspect of where, that where you've run, what were some of the issues that you were bringing up on the table? That, uh, for Mr. DeFazio? Yes. Well, the biggest thing in District 4 is the destruction of our lumber industry. Okay. Uh, he has stood there with his hands in his pockets for 20 years and watched the federal government take away essentially all access to the forests in our region and the mining as well. Uh, District 4 is about the same size as Switzerland and has far more natural resources than Switzerland. But the, in the income of the people is half that of Switzerland because District 4 is deprived of the use of its natural resources. We can't use the trees and we can't use, and we can't use the minerals. Mr. DeFazio has consistently helped to deprive us of those resources. That's one big thing that he has done. Mm -hmm. And we just, uh, I mean, the last mills are closing. We, uh, the whole industry been destroyed. I've lived there 33 years. I just watched it go down. And I watched a congressman just sit there with his hands in his pocket and smile and let it go down. In fact, sometimes he's thrown in bills to help it go down. 
That's a big thing. Uh, then in a more broad sense, a guy never saw a tax he didn't like or regulation he didn't like. And of course, taxes and regulations uh, diminish our economy, diminish our prosperity, and make it very hard for the people to live and prosper and, uh, and have a way of life even as good as their, as their parents had. Mm -hmm. And Mr. DeFazio's policies are the big spending, big taxing, big regulating policies that we get from the liberal socialists of that kind. When he comes back to campaign, he always sounds a little different because there are quite a few conservatives in the county. So that, that's a general thing. Education, you were talking about. Yeah, right. And I mentioned the D.C. schools. Uh, this is awful. This is a tragedy for those students. But there were bills introduced in Congress to give vouchers to the students so that they could pick the school that was best. Mm -hmm. Merit pay for teachers so they could have better teachers. There were a whole group of things introduced in Congress to improve those D.C. schools. Mm -hmm. Pete DeFazio voted against every one of them because he votes, for the, he votes with the public employee unions that control the schools and they don't want to change and he wants their support at election time. So he's a kind of a pragmatist, uh, a uh, sort of self-centered. So he voted against those kids because it got him campaign support from the unions at election time. Mm -hmm. That's not the way a congressman should behave. Mm -hmm. So these are the sorts of things that we differ in. But really we just differ in philosophy. I have a philosophy which is a f free enterprise, pro-freedom, anti-slavery, anti-big government, pro-constitution philosophy, and he is on the other side in, in each of those things. Mm -hmm. You know, having said that part, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, well, your business, you know, in terms of what you do. I mean, oh. uh, there's been a lot of talk about urine. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm the only congressional candidate that's ever asked the voters for a urine sample. Wow. That's huge. <laughs> and we're going to go through that, folks. We, may, we, 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 we got about another two minutes. We may take a short break because I want to spend some time on that okay. piece. So why don't we set that aside for a moment and, and let's just say that um, uh, we're going to talk about that piece. Now, uh, so what, what, does, what does art bring to the table? You have, have, having talked about DeFazio's, and, um, uh, do you bring jobs and things of that nature? Well, those, those bring themselves. Yes. Uh, people always, this good economics has been proved. Right. People always produce more than they consume and gain in prosperity if they are free to do so. America was the great example of that. They were free and the country went straight up. There was nothing America couldn't do. Now we're stumbling, and the prosperity of our people is going down. The real income of most Americans has been going down for 10 or 15 years. And the reason is freedom is diminished to the point where they can't produce more than they consume. So people in work hard, they produce more than they consume if they're free to do so. And the lack of freedom and the gradual increase of slavery to government and slavery to these big institutions mm -hmm. has gotten to the point where we consume more than we produce and the result is an economic slide which will not reverse itself until freedom is restored. And you're going to turn that around? Not by myself, but I'll sure vote for it. Okay, good, good. <laughs> what we're going to do, folks, is we're going to take a short break at this point in time and then we're going to come back and, and, and spend a little bit more time with, uh, with, the, with the chair of the Oregon Republican Party, Art Robertson. We'll take, we'll take a short break. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Welcome back, folks. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, your, your, your host here at the Oregon Voters Digest. And my guest today is the Republican Party chair, Mr. Art Robinson. And this has been a very enjoyable interview. And we're offering the same invitation to the Democratic Party and, and its chair. Uh, Bob is on the trail. He tells me he's going he's on the trail, and we're going to hopefully get him on here. Maybe we can get you two guys, uh, maybe we get these two guys uh, that would be a to lot communicate. Wouldn't that be a lot of fun, wouldn't it? I mean, they, I, they would come up with their plan, if you will, for the general election, for all of that Good. candidates running. And hopefully it's going to impact Oregonians, and mm -hmm. that's the key. We're talking about Oregon. I think now. looking at both of us. Uh, talk at the same right. time against each other is very informative voters. I think, I think I, so. I yeah, hope so. you do. Hope you manage. Well, Frank Dixon is the is the chair of the um, of the Democratic mm -hmm. Party at this point in time, and and uh, I, I I got my I got my my numbers with uh, with Bob. He's going to have them here. You know, good. Bob's going to be good. I think. It's, I, think I have some questions important. to ask him too about the things he's written about me. You know, oh, really? Not very charitable. He's written written about you. <laughs> we want to share a couple of things he might. No, have? no, you know, I wouldn't okay. do that. I'll just share with him. Okay, good. Well, you get a chance. You. Good, good. Sounds sounds <laughs> sounds great. Sounds great. You know, we were just getting into at the end of the front. We were talking about this whole issue of the urination piece. How they've been getting the pub. You've been getting national pub on this deal. In fact, even I've I've, I've looked at some of the stuff on the YouTube piece. <laughs> And it just well, blows my mind. And it's a pretty serious matter, and yeah. I'll explain. Yes, go on. Uh, it started uh, when I got out of graduate school. I was appointed to the faculty of UC San Diego. But I'd worked at Caltech with Linus Pauling, who was a famous chemist, and he came to UC San Diego about the same time, so we started working together again. Mm -hmm. And we were interested in nutrition and preventive medicine. We also were interested in chemistry. He was working on the structure of the nucleus of the atom, and I was working on protein chemistry. Uh, and I was having a lot of fun. I, I've been very lucky in life. I, I got a, went to a wonderful public school, and as I said, that took me to Caltech, and Caltech made a scientist out of me, and I've just had a great life because of it. And my parents had died, and I was alone, and I just spent all my time in the lab. And my view was, this is fantastic. I'm going to get to play all my life, and people are going to pay me for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just yeah, great. Yeah, right, right, right. But as a young man, I also started to think that I had a responsibility to the people who were making my life possible. And so I decided I'd spend half my time on the basic science I loved and half my time on things that would be immediately applicable to the welfare of the people of the country and of the world in medicine. Okay. So uh, the basic science also was relevant and, and we work on protein chemistry and proteins are the essence of life and we just published a paper not long ago on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease but it was basic biochemistry. But Linus and I had a problem because we wanted to be able to tell, for example, what is the optimum amount of vitamin C a person should eat. And that simple, you need a graph of their health versus the amount they eat. And since it's a vitamin, if they don't eat any, they don't have a life. Mm -hmm. And as they eat more, their health improves, and then it reaches a maximum, and they eat too much, and their health goes down. We'd like to know what's the optimum. We couldn't do it because we had no way to measure health quantitatively. We couldn't make the graph because we had any numbers to put on this axis. And this uh, generalizes. Uh, can you see diseases before the person knows he's sick? If he is sick, can you monitor the degree of his illness so, we can, so you can carefully uh, adjust therapy? If the therapy's working, do more of it. If it's not working, do something else. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a lot of places in medicine where you need to measure health quantitatively, whether it's an illness or a propensity of illness or whatever. And so we invented a new field. It's now called metabolomics, but we invented it in 1968. And the idea was uh, to measure as many things, as many chemicals that are part of what's called the intermediary metabolism, the chemical processes that keep you alive, to measure as many as we could quantitatively at low cost and then look within the numbers for patterns that would be useful to people. For example, uh, breast cancer. You would like to be able to see it before it shows symptoms. Mm -hmm. And cancer is a degenerative disease that develops for years before you realize you're ill. We'd like to be able to see it. And we felt that if we got enough information out of a person, we could see it. And that information is present in your blood, in your urine, and in your breath. Because the substances being made in your body are constantly being excreted as breath, urine, and mm -hmm. so on. So we started building. We built what was the best analytical lab in the world for studying urine and breath. And we proved that this worked. We were able to measure about 200 things. It took us a couple of hours to do that in one sample. 
And we did it on 15,000 people. And we proved that it was a very, very powerful method. We get 200 numbers, and we look for patterns and the numbers that were indicative of the things that... Mm -hmm. And these were quantitative because we had exact amounts of all these substances. We've worked on this all these years. Uh, we started the field, and we worked in a lot. Now the technology has advanced to the point where, with the instruments in our laboratory, we can measure 2,000 metabolites in a minute on one three-thousandth of an ounce of urine. And this now is so powerful that you could make these measurements for about the cost of Coca-Cola. So this would mean that a person's passing through the shopping center and they wonder if their child's in good shape or they're wondering about their own health. They almost like buying Coca-Cola at a pop mm -hmm. machine, find out. Mm -hmm. But the methods are very powerful analytically. 2,000 substances are what we would call parameters. 2,000 quantitative measurements of chemicals being produced by your body is just virtually everything about your metabolism is known. But you have to calibrate them because we do not know enough about human chemistry, biochemistry to know how much of those things should be there. We can only do it empirically. It's like fingerprints. In fact, it is a fingerprint. I can, if I took a urine sample and measured it for someone, it's just as distinctive as their fingerprint mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of their genetics. So we need to calibrate these tools. So for example, going back to the breast cancer analysis, in order to calibrate the method so that we could, if the machine can do so, see cancer two years before the lady is afflicted, we have to have samples from people taken two years before they got sick. This means we have to take a lot of samples from women and wait. And after a few develop breast cancer, we'll then, and we wait, we put those samples, store them cryogenically so they don't deteriorate, they're mm -hmm. super cold. And then suppose we got 10 ladies who were mis unfortunate enough to contract the disease. We go back in the freezer and pick up the samples they had two years ago. And we take those also from women who didn't get the disease and then we can calibrate the machine to see the disease early. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But in order to do that, we have to have thousands and thousands of samples. We have to have 15, in our, the goal of our research is to have 15,000 people giving a sample every six months. Mm -hmm. And then we wait, and some of them are, um, they're valuable immediately. Like you, you want to look at a pattern for a disease just for diagnostic purposes. Mm -hmm get 30 people that have these and 30 that don't, compare them and look for a pattern. Uh, but our goal is to have 15,000 people give a sample every six months for five years. And the disease incidence statistics are such that that will calibrate this machinery for practical use uh, on an, quite a number of illnesses. So, and the other thing is you have to do it uh, in a practical way. And the practical way is to take samples from people without any control. In other words, you don't say, well, we're going to have this controlled study, and you're going to live on a controlled diet, and we're going to do mm -hmm. all this mumbo-jumbo. You could publish a paper, be no good to the guy in the street. Mm -hmm. So we're collecting the samples just from the people. This machine can measure 10,000 things. It's redundant because of the isotope effect, so it measures 5,000 different chemicals in that minute. We estimate about 2,000 are relevant metabolites. So the differences in diet, the differences other kinds of differences uh, aren't affecting us because we can see so much. And so we're just asking Oregonians to participate. Mm -hmm. So we just sent out a mailing telling about our research to some of the Southern Oregon, and we got 7,000 volunteers, and we already had 1,000, that's 8,000. Mm -hmm. So if we do one more mailing, we'll have our 15,000. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. And once they, they, they send their name and address in, and we send them a kit which has two cryogenic vials, and they give us about a milliliter of urine in each vial. Comes back, we store it in minus 80 degree freezers, so it, it's permanently stored. And uh, we're gonna ask them every six months. So uh, we're very pleased because this mailing we just did brought in 7,000 volunteers, Oregonians who are willing to participate. Hmm. It's uh, not like biochemistry where you're studying something, you understand it very carefully and so forth. But if you want to help human beings, you have to help them as they are. Mm -hmm. I could say to you, well, give us a lot of money for research. And about 100 years from now, we'll know enough that we might be able to diagnose a disease just because we understand. 
But the things we don't understand, that's not going to help you. Right, 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 right. But if we can calibrate what we can see about you with modern technology, then we can improve your health now. Are there other entities out there doing this, this kind of a research? Well, there, yeah, it's a whole research field now. I was asked a couple field. of years okay. ago to write the first chapter in a book about this because we originated the field and tell about our really work. It's now a, a standard field of science, but it has not helped people. And the reason is this kind of calibration work that we're engaged in now mm -hmm. hasn't been done. People will they'll get a few samples from somebody with an illness and a few controls that don't have the illness, and they compare them and publish in the literature. Mm. Well, that makes a nice publication, but it isn't practical. You haven't done enough that it could find its way into modern medicine. Mm -hmm. You have to calibrate in a large population and do the kind of things we're doing before it could be offered as a medical technique. Mm. So it's much more powerful. You go to the doctor today, he'll measure about 20 things in a blood sample, or 10 in a urine sample. And they don't even look for a pattern. They just look at them ingly to see if one of them is way out of the normal range. There's another aspect to this. When you get serial samples on a person, then you evaluate him on the basis using himself as his control. Then all the genetic differences go away, and you can see even far more about him. Mm -hmm. In other words, suppose we see a pattern that's characteristic of you, mm -hmm. and we would. Mm -hmm. And then we see it every six months. Mm -hmm. After we have four or five points on you, if you deviate from that pattern, we'll be able to see that 10 times as well because we're comparing you to yourself, not to the whole population, which is quite different, quite variable. So this job, that uh, seems a little mundane, but this job of getting what we call just casual urine samples, just no control, just get a sample and send it to us, and then calibrating this extremely powerful machinery in its efforts to get information out can help a lot. Now, maybe it's an unfortunate time to do this because we're all worried about all the spying on us, right? Right, right, right. right. So we don't like the idea that the mm -hmm. government's collecting all this information. And those are issues that have to be concerned. We have to be concerned. In our case, uh, this is totally confidential. Mm -hmm. Nothing, uh, no aspect of this is ever in a computer that's even hooked to the Internet. Mm -hmm. So the people's privacy is maintained. But anything the government can learn about you. You see, in private medical care, I feel comfortable about it. Right now, they're socializing medicine. The Obama administration wants to have everybody's medical records on computers that they can look at. That, I think, is very dangerous. And a lot of people wouldn't want their urine analysis on a computer that Mr. Obama could look at. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. So that's another reason to emphasize freedom, because this government spying, you, without privacy, you have no freedom. Privacy is essential to freedom. Mm -hmm. And we're in a national debate now because the government's violating our privacy. Mm -hmm. Well, the more information you get about someone's health, like through urine analysis and eventually be breath analysis, the more you can do for their health. Mm -hmm. But you have to live in a political system where you don't violate their privacy doing it. Mm -hmm. And this is perfectly capable of doing. But it, it, if the government runs the whole medical system, you can be sure that nobody's privacy with respect to their urine analysis mm -hmm. be there. Well, you know, what comes to mind, you know, from, uh, you know, from that just as a layperson aspect, yeah. that the thing that comes out with, with, with some of the cultures are things like um, uh, lupus, mm -hmm. uh, sickle cell, mm -hmm. things along like that line. Are those curable? They going through maybe a process. Oh like yeah. This? Well, there's the more you learn, the more you can do. Right. Sickle cell anemia was the first molecular disease that was understood. And it's an interesting, it was a very interesting disease because uh, a large fraction of the people in Africa, indigenous to Africa, had the disease. And the reason they had it, if you have with both genes for sickle cell, you have, you have the disease if, you know, you have two of everything genetically. And if you have both, you have sickle cell anemia. If you have one, one gene that has a sickle cell gene and one that doesn't, mm -hmm. you don't have the disease, but a fourth of your children will. You know? mm -hmm. So a fourth of your children will. Right, right, right. Uh, it turns out that if you are what we call heterozygote, you don't have the disease, but you're carrying the sickle cell gene, mm -hmm. it helps you to be immune to, from malaria. And malaria is so endemic to Africa that the disadvantage of having the disease in the population was overcome by the extra survival because it made you immune from malaria. Wow. <laughs> and, and it turns out it was a single mutation of a single amino acid on the hemoglobin molecule. That's the molecule that carries your oxygen in your blood. 
And when you have that mutation, it changes the structure of the molecule and causes the molecules that carry the oxygen in your blood to kind of crystallize. When they do, they distort the shape of your blood cells and cause them to stick in the capillaries and they can't get out to the peripheral parts of your tissues and you deoxygenate your, your peripheral. Mm -hmm. and typically, it used to be that uh, the sickle cell victim might live about 10 years and die and it's very painful and very horrible disease. And one-fourth of the people whose parents were carrying one of those genes got the disease. I think they extended, uh, last time I looked at this, uh, lifespan was about 20 years, and it's probably increasing because of things that have been developed. But it's, it's not a good disease, but it's very, very prevalent because of the, this quirk that it m made people immune from malaria. Mm -hmm. Malaria, you see, kills millions and millions yes. of people every yeah. year. It doesn't have to, but the environmental movement has banned the insecticides that were stopping it. The United States was uh, basically eradicated, malaria was eradicated in the United States using uh, good insecticides. Uh, and they were beginning to eradicate it in Africa and other countries with insecticides. And then a bunch of elitist enviros came along and said, well, you can't use those insecticides. So mm -hmm. malaria shot right back up mm -hmm. in the third mm -hmm. world. But um, I had a friend, uh, I published a paper once, he was a chief physician for Albert Schweitzer in Africa. And he said that when he was a physician running Schweitzer's hospital, everybody had malaria. The patients, the doctors, the nurses, everybody. <laughs> and it was a little different. <laughs> so the advantage uh, against malaria made sickle cell, kept sickle cell in the population. Uh, it was the first molecular disease. A man named Harvey Atano discovered this. It was published, Atano, Pauling, Singer, and Wells published a paper showing why sickle cell anemia occurs and that it's a mutation of one amino acid. It was a great event in biochemistry because it was the first disease of a molecule that was ever mm -hmm. uh, discovered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so now we've got, we've gone through this, you know, the, 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 the other yeah. media actually got in touch with you and, and as opposed oh, to... Oh, there, there, there are a few questions. Pieces. They've been pretty charitable. Okay. Uh, Mr. DeFazio hasn't. He, he's saying I'm a nut because I'm interested in collecting urine samples. Right. I, don't, I don't care what DeFazio right. thinks. Right. I've been doing this work for 30 years. I started the field. And it's a big field with thousands of research papers mm -hmm. published in it. But mm -hmm. Mr. DeFazio is not interested in that. He's interested in whether he can make his opponent look screwy. Mm -hmm. so. You know, health care is another issue I'd like to ask you, because being you, be you the chair and whatever, you've got the troops going out there and the general election aspect of it. You know, a lot of folks have had some sort of confusion in terms of what the state health care system is as yeah. opposed to the federal health care. There's always been talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the, the, I'd say the masses of the of, of the population really don't really understand. Yeah. They, they, in many ways, they do need health care. I've always made the point that we've always had uh, health care across the board anyway because you walk in any hospital and get care. That's right. Fair? Yeah. That's right? That's right. Okay. So wh why the confusion? Well, uh, any idea? The, any uh, the, again, the state wants to control you. I've done medical research all my life. I've, this one field we just discussed was a very principal part of that, but I've done other medical research. When I started this, as I mentioned, I wanted to do some good for my fellow man. Uh, and I've been very disappointed because I've seen not just our laboratory, but many other medical advances that never got to the people. And they didn't get to the people because of the government. It, it, people don't realize that it now costs two billion dollars to get approval for a new drug. You have to pay that much to get the federal bureaucracy to approve it. And of course the pharmaceutical company executives and the executives in the government are the same people. They oscillate back and forth like they do with the banks. So there's this, this medical monopoly controlled by people at the top Mm -hmm. And unless there's a huge amount of money on the table that can be taken away from the people in the medical care system and they can get their fingers on it, they won't let it in. And a lot of the things you can do, especially in nutrition and preventive medicine, don't cost much. So, for example, if we were to find that a disease responds to vitamin B6, I mean, there's no way you can patent vitamin B6. Mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. money in it. Mm -hmm. And if you were to just advertise that B6 cured the disease, it's going to cost you a couple of billion dollars to get permission to advertise. So that's not worked on. Uh, this thing we're talking about, I told you that uh, might be possible to provide 
uh, preventive medicine with these 2,000 sample analyses, mm -hmm. uh, substance analyses for, for the cost of a Coke. Yeah, but how it, might, it would cost you billions to get permission to do the analysis. See, we're doing this experimentally, but if we were to start to give people back information about their health from our experiments, they'd put us in jail. Hmm. We'd be practicing medicine without a license and using an unapproved procedure wow. to give information wow. to people about their health, and that's against the law. Hmm. So there are tremendous impediments to the advance of medicine that have been put in. First, it's 18% of our economy, huge amounts of money. Two-thirds of that money doesn't even go to the doctors. It goes to the bureaucrats. When you go to the doctor, what do you see? Well, several women shuffling paper. Right. And the doctor's back behind trying right. to make enough money to pay everybody. Right. And those people are shuffling paper because the government makes them do so. So medicine has become very, very expensive because of government meddling. This is before Obamacare. Right, right, right. And the system that they've put in makes it cost enormous amounts of money to make even the tiniest advance. I worked with a man who had a Nobel Prize in chemistry, a very famous man, one of the people I was fortunate to work with. This man published 60 papers on a new antibiotic, which would be far better than the antibiotics we have. Never been commercialized. Yeah. He put it all in the public domain and no patents. Gee. The accountants for the company would say, well, we could produce that thing, but it costs us $2 billion to get it approved. We never get our money back. So the, the uh, people don't realize how much the advance of medicine has been impeded by government meddling already. And, of course, now to go to full-blown socialized medicine is just a nightmare. Mm -hmm. it's, it's terrible. And I spent 50 years in medical research and... We've done some nice things. We've made some contributions. We've published a lot of nice papers. This one field we were talking about, we're prominent in that field. But mostly, I'm looking at things that people should have that they don't have. It always comes back to this giant monopoly that's run by the government and the pharmaceutical companies and the medical societies. They've all got a hand in it. And there's 18% of the wealthy American people flowing through that monopoly. And the price of entry for a new medical procedure is so high that most of the new discoveries don't make it. Hmm. Hmm. It's, it's not good. It's interesting. Okay, now in another area, we got about another four minutes or so. I, that educational background that you shared with me at, mm -hmm. at one point in time, I, th I think that would be of some of, of interest in because we still, like I said, that ed educate, as you know, the governor is now the new education czar. I don't know where, I don't know where, um, uh, if in fact, if uh, Richardson would be given, the, no, 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 Dennis, yeah. Dennis was get, would given the opportunity to be governor, uh, what, his, what would his position be? Would he go back to the old system, you think? Or, well, I would hope. Dennis Richardson is a very fine man. Right, and right. Oregon would be very fortunate yeah. to have him. And his instincts, I can't speak for him, and I don't want to get him into trouble by yeah. making a comment about what he would do. Right. But I think uh, everybody uh, that's knowledgeable about this realizes we need to go back to local control. Mm -hmm. And this thing about the governor running the schools in our, in our state is ridiculous mm -hmm. and is harmful. And I, I think that uh, I don't know what Dennis's first step would be because you see you're here and you want to be here. If a man will go 10% of the way, you're 10% of the way. And how far Dennis would try to go if he were governor, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. But I know he's a very fine man with very good instincts and a great love of human freedom and the American way of life. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sure that he would take steps in the right direction, but I don't know what steps he thinks he could take mm -hmm. in, in his first term of office. Well, as you, as you know, there's another race that's going to be look, really looked at and that's uh, in, the, in the arena, and that's, that's Monica would be. Mm -hmm. And uh, any, any thoughts about that? Well, that's that? a lot simpler in education. Okay, good. Because the United States Constitution, the 10th Amendment of the United States Constitution, makes it unconstitutional for the federal government to meddle in education. I'm running as a federal candidate as well. It's pretty simple. I oppose federal involvement in education. The money the federal government is getting now that's going into education should immediately come back to the states. Mm -hmm. Because under the Constitution, education is a responsibility of the states and the people. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting resources be diminished, but 
not a dollar should be being spent by Washington. Mm -hmm. The money they're collecting that's going into education today should all come to the states and in my business, in my view, be distributed to the localities. But the states are allowed constitutionally to be involved in education. The Tenth Amendment says any power not given to the government in the Constitution is reserved to the states and the people. That includes education. So I haven't talked to Monica about it, but I would assume that she would feel that the Constitution means that all the control of education should come back to the states, and that's mm -hmm. what I advocate. Mm -hmm. You know, another issue that for my, in this, this area is, is kind of interesting uh, about the marijuana push, if you will, mm -hmm. by uh, by i.e. the congressman uh, Earl Blumenauer mm -hmm. who basically represents this area but really did a lot of times in terms of getting involved in the other mm -hmm. issues we've, we've had pro problems yeah. trying to get him involved in mm -hmm. but he's taken this 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 lead role if you will of this, pushing the marijuana this is going to be very up. interesting what, what, what this doing? is going to be a great exercise in federalism this too the power over marijuana for example is reserved to the states we're going to have 50 states trying 50 different things, and we're going to find out what worked. And Oregon will have a policy, Texas will have a policy, Oklahoma will have a policy, that's the way federalism right, works. Right, right. And we can all look at each other, and probably one of these states is going to get it right. Then we'll know what the policy should be. That's great, that's great. Well, look, we got about 30 seconds left. Any, any lasting comments? On our, our yeah, vote Republican. Okay, all right. <laughs> Boy, that was, that was no. right down that. Listen, if you really look closely, okay. you'll find each voter would find that the Republican policies are closer to what he intuitively understands are good for him mm -hmm. and good for his family. And I think that uh, if they look closely at this, they'll vote for us. Good. And we've got some great candidates to carry in those, carry those policies into, into action. Well, thank you very much. And then the other lasting comment, hopefully you'll be available to come and give us a little update. Oh, I love to come. And, and of course, this debate if you can ever get that Democrat chairman across the table, I'll be, I'll be here with bells on. All right. On that note, <laughs> all right, thank you very much. This Thanks. has been great. This has thank been great. You. All right, folks, there you go. He's the, Repub the Republican chair of the Republican Party, Art Robinson. Okay, fine. Mr. A. Frank, come on over, buddy. We, we were looking for you, waiting for you. <laughs> Oregon Oregonian wants to know where you are and where you stand oh, on yeah. those issues. Okay, fine. You might have to get a bigger room. Oh, no. <laughs> hey, folks, thank you very much. I'll see you next week. Have a good one. Take care.